Good afternoon and welcome to IAB There, our weekly live stream in which we connect the digital advertising ecosystem. I'm Cheryl Goldstein, Chief Industry Growth Officer for the IAB. In today's session, which is titled Marketers, Brands, and Sex Talk, we'll be discussing the influence of the internet on how people in society view sex. We'll also be discussing the existing stigmas and limitations around marketing and sex and how brands aren't thinking about the total person and the sexual side of being human when creating campaigns and products. And there isn't anyone better to have this conversation with than the guest I have today. So please welcome Cindy Gallup, founder and CEO, CEO of Make Love Not Porn. Cindy, hello, I'm so glad to have you here. I am so excited, like how often do I get to like in this job talk about porn and sex and you know raunchy stuff like that I'm so excited <laughs> uh, Cheryl I'm excited too because I'm thrilled to be here and I'm absolutely delighted that the IAB is having this incredibly important conversation yeah, well I I think it really is important and I'll just start by a couple of quick things so I saw you give this talk I don't know if it was a TED talk but it was something equivalent to that where you talk about the the, the rationale behind the whole initiative how you you know hot, gorgeous woman in her middle ages, young lover, uh, doing things that were questionable and like maybe concerning even and wondering where and why this young man would think this was something you wanna do only to discover that he was learning all these things from porn. And the thing is that I have uh, my partner, my wife is a crisis counselor in high school. And I asked her about this and she said, it is more of a crisis than you even realize that these teens come into her office, um, sometimes hysterical, like a young girls with marks on their neck crying, like my boyfriend does these things. And I don't know how to tell them I don't like it. And then the boyfriends, I don't know if, if I'm supposed to do this or not, but this is what I think I'm supposed to be doing. So there's really something out there around this. So I was very eager to get you here today to talk about what it is that you're doing, why it's important and um, just, uh, with that set up, let's hear. Let's hear more. And I'm and I'm with you. I'm with you all the way. Gerald, I'm I'm so happy you're wearing our merch. Honestly, I just I, I adore I love that. It. So, I wear it with so, pride. so um so a um, couple of things um uh, in response to that, Cheryl. First of all, for our audience's benefit, it wasn't young man, it was young men. I'm very oh. open about the fact that I date younger men casually in recreation. I date a lot of them simultaneously. And you and, go, girl. <laughs> and, and, and really, you know, Make Love Not Porn um, was an accident um, because it came out of my personal experience dating young men. But also it's important to remember that, you know, I was the very first person now um, 13 years ago to actually stand up on a stage publicly at TED in 2009 and talk about this issue I'd identified through direct personal experience which is when we don't talk openly and honestly about sex in the real world, porn becomes sex education by default in not a good way. And 13 years ago, nobody else was talking about this. Nobody else was writing about it. And so that is why, you know, my TED talk had the most extraordinary impact. Um, separate to the fact that I also became the only TED speaker to say the words, come on my face, on the 10th stage, six times in succession. You know, that, that could also have had something to do with why the talk went viral instantly. Um, Maybe that's but, why I tuned in. I don't know, something drew me to it. Absolutely. <laughs> but, but basically the entire world responded. Thousands of people wrote to me from every country, you know, young, old, male, female, straight, gay. That was when I realized I'd uncovered a huge global social issue. Yeah. And so that was what led me to turn Make Love Not Porn into what it is today. Uh, because it started out as a clunky little porn world versus real world site. And today we are the world's first and only user generated, human curated social sex video sharing platform. So we are basically what Facebook would be if Facebook allowed you to socially, sexually self-express, which it doesn't. We are bringing all the dynamics of social media to this one area of universal human experience no other social platform allows. And in that sense, if porn is the Hollywood blockbuster movie, Make Love Not Porn is the real world documentary. Mm -hmm. Our tagline is pro-sex, pro-porn, pro-knowing the difference. 
And what we are is a unique window onto the funny, messy, fabulous, wonderful, loving ways we all have sex in the real world. And at its heart, Cheryl, um, ultimately our mission is to end rape culture, yeah. to end what is sending these teens distressed into your wife's office. And we end rape culture by doing something incredibly simple that nevertheless nobody else is doing. We end rape culture by showing you how wonderful great consensual communicative sex is in the real world. Our social sex videos role model good sexual values and good sexual behavior. And, and this is the key part, we make all of that aspirational versus what we see in porn and popular culture. And so Make Love Not Porn is spearheading what we call the social sex revolution. The revolutionary part is not the sex, it's the social. Now, how do you, so, so just for, pe for clarity, people actually upload videos of they and their partner or partners making love, having sex, but doing it in a genuine, authentic way so that a 16 year old, 17 year old has a place to go to see what a tender, loving, or like a real sexual encounter could look like, not this kind of male, typically male fantasy version, which you find in porn, um, how do you find people to do this? And is there a vetting process? Can anyone upload a video? And how do you make sure that you're getting almost a diversity of representation, even in the way that you're showing that? Sure. So, um, so, so first of all, um, Cheryl, just for our audience's benefit, um, it's important to say that um, you know, we are as an entirely legal adult content site for 18 and over viewers. Okay. However, that being said, I will tell you that many parents write to us telling us that they are buying their teenage children subscriptions to Make Love Not Porn because they want them to see what happy, healthy, loving sex relationships look mm. like. And obviously, as far as parents are concerned, they know you know, um, what right. they want to manage and, and it's up to them. Um, so um, before I launched Make Love Not Porn TV back in 2012, obviously we had to seed the platform with content pre-launch. So I and my then curator, Sarah, spent a whole year asking everybody in our networks and complete strangers, will you film yourselves having real world sex for us? And this is how, so, so basically, Cheryl, you know, whenever I had a conversation about Make Love Not Porn, I would always end it by asking the question, would you be interested in contributing content? And I would always ask the question, irrespective of whether I personally thought the person would or wouldn't, which is how I found out that 99.9% of the time, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. To the extent that I literally, on a number of occasions, had to force my facial features to stay immobile because I want to go, what? <laughs> um, so we discovered the desire to do this lies a lot closer to the surface in many more people than you would ever have thought. And given a reason, given our social mission, our social values, people jump at the chance. Mm -hmm. Not least because I designed Make Love Not Porn through the female lens. And what I mean by that is I designed it around what everybody else should have, nobody else did, human curation. Mm. There is no self-publishing of anything on Make Love Not Porn. Our curators watch every video from beginning to end before we approve and we publish it. They uh, review every member profile post, every comment in every video. We are the safest place on the internet accordingly. And so people know that our brand is built on trust and they feel really happy to contribute content and i designed make love not porn to be fully inclusive from the get-go we are for male female trans non-binary every possible race ethnicity you know um, now and now we are bootstrapping um i've had enormous challenges raising funding we can't yeah. do all the community outreach we would like to but we do everything we can to present a fully diverse spectrum of glorious human real world sex yeah no i was looking around the site and i was like hmm it should probably have something like sex over 50 you know well, like Oh, 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 and we do. We're, we're, so we, have, we, we have many older Make Love Not Porn stars, um, as we have many older members. In fact, um, to, you know, I, I just shared on social a few days ago a wonderful comment 
left on, um, I think it was our Make Love Not Porn stars, Wander and Lust, a lovely couple. And Wonder there was this, and Lust. I, love that. I know, great name, right? No. And there was this comment on the video that said something like, you know, we watched this, we loved it, you know, normally, you know, when we watch a Make Love Not Porn video, we follow it by slow dancing and cruising into the bedroom. This time we never even made it off the couch. Mm. Look, you can still be spontaneous at 75. That's and so, and, and so this is from a 75 year old couple going, that's, whoopee. That's inspiring, I love it. Yeah. So Cindy, I want to talk a little bit. You are an icon in the advertising business, right? You just have an outstanding resume. I, I mean, I could take half an hour just to talk about all of your amazing accomplishments and head of agencies, working with brands. You love to blow shit up. Um, and working with brands, blow shit up with brands. Let's talk a little bit about how brands think about sex. Where is there a miss, both in their marketing and maybe even in product um, innovation? So let's take a, a second and talk about that too. Sure. So there are two um, huge misses that brands, agencies, and our industry as a whole um, are currently making. And the first one can be exemplified by a talk that I gave at Cannes, um, and this would have been, gosh, nine years ago now, I think, um, where I spoke on porn, youth, and brands, the biggest socio-cultural influence on young people today that we don't talk about. And I spoke, therefore, to a stacked out audience, as you can imagine. And so I said to the audience, okay, show of hands, please. Um, please raise your hand, everybody who here who is a strategic planner. So a whole forest of hands goes up. I, I went, great, keep your hand up. If you are the kind of strategic planner who, when developing a strategy for the client, writing a brief for the credit department, writes something like this. Our target audience is an 824 old young man. This is where he lives, the kind of work he does, where he likes to hang out with his friends. This is how many hours of porn he watches a week. And this is how that impacts his relationship with his girlfriend. No hands. I said to the audience, we do consumers a huge disservice when we do not bring to this universal air of human experience the same psychological analysis, consumer insight and understanding we do to every other area of human attitudes and behavior. So um, I was then brought back to Cannes a couple of years later by the global research group Flamingo who said to me, they said, you're absolutely right. They said they were frustrated because they're a research company and they never get asked to do any research into this area. So I spoke for them at Cannes on a panel called Sex, the Final Marketing Frontier. <laughs> and I talked to the audience about, and this is the second huge myth. So I said to the audience, people have sex in cards, especially in markets, countries around the world, where for social cultural reasons, you know, premarital sex is frowned upon. In markets where it's usual for young people to live at home with their parents till they get married, which by the way, given the economy is now at the US as well, right, or right. In, in markets where whole households live together communally and therefore even husbands and wives can't find privacy to be intimate. So all around the world, a huge number of people are having a huge amount of sex in a huge number of cars. Yet the automotive industry is spectacularly failing to factor this into product design and marketing. Even more fundamentally, people have sex in bed, but the mattress industry focuses all its R&D on sleep. People have sex on kitchen counters, but the kitchen industry isn't factoring that into height, depth, width, comfort. The point being, Cheryl, that there is a far broader business application of all of this than simply directly sex social brands and our industry and brands and agencies are leaving money on the table when they don't leverage that fact. Are, are people listening? Are brands listening to you? Have you been called into in your consulting business and hey, help us, we're a mattress company, we're a car company, help us think differently about this or is it you're yelling from the mountaintop to a bunch of deaf ears? So, so first of all, Cheryl, I want to give full credit to um, our industry's media, you know, in the same way, you know, I'm giving full credit to you and I be for having this conversation, right. because I have to say, you know, Ad Week campaign, Ad Age PR Week, over the, the drum, they've been enormously supportive 
in terms of putting this message out there. And in fact, I especially want to credit the wonderful Oliver McAteer, who, th this is when he was at campaign, he's now working for the agency No Fixed Address, um, so, sorry, Mischief and No Fixed Address. Um, but when he was working campaign, so he wrote an article about this, and he even took my words, and he called up every automotive brand he could to ask them about this. None of them would take his call, except for one. Okay, um, full credit to Aston Martin for actually taking a call from Ollie going- They know so, their audience, Aston yeah, Martin. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, uh, and, and so Ollie said, so, you know, would you, would you consider redesigning your cars to be great to have sex in? And the chief marketing officer was going, rum, 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 don't know about that. <laughs> um, so, um, so actually the media have been enormously supportive, but I have to tell you that um, I have yet to really see um, a brand um, welcome in this perspective and think thoughtfully about how they could leverage it strategically and creatively. And, and sadly, Cheryl, that even goes um, for the brands that that do have a lot to do with sexual health and wellness, because even they can be nervous of being too frank, you know, about about what they stand for. So I'm not seeing it happen yet, but I'm very confident um, that as more and more of the barriers break down, we will. Yeah, because like you're right, they kind of dance around it. Like they'll say, it's a product for down there. <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. Intimacy. Intimate <laughs> or down there. You know, it's like, really? You know, are we that embarrassed to even like refer to our body parts? No, and, and, and also, Cheryl, the important thing is, as I said, um, consumers would thank us. You know, yeah. honestly, normalizing, socializing all of this, which is exactly what we're doing in Make Love Not Porn, you know, people are desperate to have that happen. I think one of the reasons that my clunky little original Make Love Not Porn.com site got the reaction it did after my TED talk is because Make Love Not Porn.com was a manifestation of me. And what I mean by that is it was very simple, straightforward, truthful, down to earth, utterly non judgmental, and it mm -hmm. had a sense of humor. We never get to have conversations about sex within those parameters. The moment we do, the floodgates open. I think you're right. Uh, do you think it's easier to talk about male sexuality? Like somehow I'll see all kinds of ads about broken penises, you know, all over television, but you don't hear or see as much about maybe sexual issues women are having, or do you feel like there's, more leniency and forgiveness for things related to men, erectile dysfunction, broken penises, things like that. They seem to be very free and open and accepting advertising in that, in that way. I don't see as much for women. Is that just because there's not as much product or solutions for them or are brands just, it's not as easy to advertise? Well, well first of all, um... Uh, you're absolutely right, Cheryl, because there is a massively um, gendered bias at play here. Yeah. So Make Love Not Porn, despite the fact that we're out to end rape culture, we are banned from advertising. We can't advertise on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. We also can't advertise in traditional media. The MTA would not allow me to advertise on billboards, the subway. But it's not just us, and it's not just sex related. Uh, the same holds true for any female lens sexual health and wellness brand. Menstruation ventures can't advertise mm. on Facebook and Instagram. Menopause ventures can't. Fertility ventures can't. In the meantime, erectile dysfunction solutions Everywhere. come in. Yeah. And, and the depressing thing, though, Cheryl, is that um, what is welcomed on social media and the media generally in advertising is a very superficial, stereotypical male lens um, approach to sex. Now, what I find fascinating, um, because Make Love at Porn is a social experiment. You know, mm -hmm. we put our platform out there. We don't dictate what real world sex is. You, the world, your community show us, and we're learning all the time. So as I said to you earlier, I designed Make Love Not Porn to be fully diverse and inclusive. But I have to tell you that we are especially a revelation for men. We probably get more emails from men than anybody else because what we are is something men never encounter otherwise, which is a safe space where men can be and men can see other men being open, emotional and vulnerable around sex. And men are desperate for that. 
I picked right. up an amazing Twitter exchange a few months back um, between two men. One man had tweeted jokingly, hey guys, you know, I've got this really w weird porn fetish. I want to watch porn where people are honest, loyal, and decent and love each other. Hit me up with your hottest links, please. <laughs> and, um, and, and a man replied, another man, and he said, there's this website called Make Love Not Porn, where you can see real people, real couples making love. He said, I watched a video where a woman said to her man, I love you while they were making love. He said, I cried when I heard that. Oh. That, is, that is how emotionally men respond to something that they, they won't see anywhere else, which is the ability to make yourself vulnerable and, and to see real intimacy and connection. And, and so, you know, that is in direct contrast to this very male lens, sex sells superficially scenario that we yeah. see in our own world of advertising as much as in the content in popular culture generally. And yeah. so everybody benefits when you allow the female lens on all of this, both in terms of being able to advertise, but at the same time then being able to educate and inform, which we are not able to do currently. And I think the other thing too, when you look at some of these, not that I'm a big porn watcher, but I'm just saying in my limited experience, there's exaggeration across the board. Like how many men are really that well endowed, you know? So that could be a little intimidating. If you're a guy watching this stuff going, wow, is that what I'm supposed to look like? Is that what I'm supposed to do? And if they're uncomfortable with it, and then, you know, you have these young women, teenage, early, you know, late teen inexperienced, and you said this in your TED talk, that don't really know how to communicate to really, and so, you know, guiding these guys are kind of lost too. So I could see why they would be drawn to make love not poor because it helps them understand, like, first of all, I'm okay with the body I have and, you know, with what I've been given, I'm perfectly normal and fine. And this is really the kind of thing that I'm more comfortable doing and I, and I feel better about it and my partner is going to enjoy it more. So it, I think, um, I think it's a great thing for men. I really yeah, do. I, no, exactly. And I want to pick up on what you said there, Cheryl, because there's a very important part of what Make Love Not Porn is doing that I want our industry to do as well. Because, you know, as you said, at Make Love Not Porn, we celebrate real world everything. Right. Real world bodies, real world hair, real world penis size, real <laughs> world breast size. And the reason that's so important is because you can talk body positivity all you like. Right. You can preach self-love till you're blue in the face. At the end of the day, nothing makes us feel great about our own bodies, like seeing people who are no one's idea of aspirational body types getting turned on by each other, mm -hmm. desiring each other, having an amazing time in bed. Our mantra at Make Love Not Porn is everybody is beautiful when they're having real world sex, and they really are. And this is so key in a world where popular culture, advertising included, constantly sends us messages that say, you are not sexually desirable unless you are this skinny, six pack abs, look like this. Our members write to us and say, you made me feel better about my own body. One man wrote and said, my girlfriend and I now feel able to be more open and central with each other because you made each of us feel better mm -hmm. about our own bodies. And that is so enormously important for self-esteem and self-acceptance and, and self-comfort. Yeah, I would think that, you know, it's reassuring to have, to know that there's not something wrong with you and see that people can, you know, can enjoy sex at any age with any kind of body. Um, how are you, what do you think about this kind of cancel culture? I feel like instead of the world becoming more open about these kind of conversations, it's going the other way. It's like people are afraid, brands I think are afraid to say something or do something that might rock the boat. And you know, if anything, they're less likely to have these open conversations. That's what it seems to me. Would you agree with that? Do you think that's happening? I mean, do you know, um, you know the, the answer to that is very, very simple, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, again, it's what I've been talking about for many years because you know, I believe that everything in life starts with you and your values. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I've been saying to both individuals and brands for literally decades is, 
you know, if you've never done this exercise, take a long, hard look into yourself and identify what you stand for, what you believe in, what you value, what you're all about. And then live your life and do your work according to that. Because here's the interesting thing. When you, when you live and work according to your values, you are guaranteeing that you will never be discovered to be doing anything that you're ashamed of. Right. As a brand, you don't need to worry about cancel culture if you are coming from a place of utter authenticity and integrity. And in fact, honestly, Cheryl, you also don't have to worry when you are constantly acting on communicating your truth, your principles, your values, you don't have to worry about what you say because right. you are being true to you, it's grounded in values, and you don't have to fear that you will be canceled for anything. I think that's a great lesson in life, you know, just in general, you know, just Ooh. be you. Don't worry about monitoring your thoughts or your feelings. And if you're being true to yourself and authentic, then, you know, you have nothing to apologize for, first Ooh. of all. And, you know, I think people will at least respect that. So I, I hope brands are listening. Uh, so we have a couple of minutes left here, some last minute, what should brands stop doing? What should they start doing? Quick little tips. You know, if I'm a brand marketer right now listening to this, help me think about something I should stop doing and maybe something I should start doing. Sure. Any I think, you know, one thing that I would love brands to stop doing is to stop thinking about themselves as being in transmit mode and their audiences as being in receive mode. I do not see enough brands being truly interactive in the real sense of the word. And, and, and the reason I emphasize that, Cheryl, is because, you know, today you have to um, live on the basis of real time responsiveness. Mm -hmm. And you have to live on the basis of learning from your community all the time. And so it's not about crafting the perfect message, the perfect communication strategy. It's about putting, you know, what you want to put out there, but then welcoming responses, being open to them and actually learning from them and organically developing your marketing and your communications and your advertising accordingly. Um, every campaign should be a living, breathing thing based mm -hmm. on true interactivity between the brand and its audience. And I, and I do not see that um, happening because brands continue to think in this old world order way of we put stuff out there, the consumer receives it, end of story. No, 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 no. And, so and the results are we sold something. Yeah, and obviously, by the way, I'm saying this from the perspective of selling because you will sell way more if your consumers feel that you are actively welcoming them into a dialogue. Yeah. And, um, and, and by the way, um, I will just give our audience, um, for me, a very personal demonstration of how much this isn't happening um, in a particular sector. So every year, um, I live tweet my reading of the Vogue magazine September issue. I've been doing this for the past several years. Um, I began doing this um, a few years back and people really enjoyed it. And so now every year I announce to my followers, right, on this day, I will be doing this. And what I do is I read, as you know, the September issue of Vogue is that doorstopper. Yeah, so I read it from beginning to end and I comment on every ad, every piece of editorial, every fashion spread. And I obviously, Cheryl, especially do that through the lens of gender equality, diversity and inclusion. Love so what, what, what this results in is for the past several years, a very long um, Twitter thread in which I tag every single brand um, that I'm commenting on, as well as Vogue and Condé Nast. I've been doing this for, I don't know, five years now. And up to this year, not a single brand <clears throat> ever responded to me, including the ones I praised. I mean, I obviously had critiques, but there were also brands doing brilliant things that I praised. Not a single brand ever replied. And by the way, the fashion industry, you know, prides itself on being digitally future forward. Um, <laughs> right. um, I, I will just give credit to this year for the first time ever, sorry, this past year, September 2021, for the first time ever, one brand responded, Nordstrom. Uh -huh. um, that was that was the only one out of all of the luxury brands. So that's what I mean when I when I say there is no dialogue happening. Wow. Okay? 
So, um, so that's what I want brands to stop doing, you know, don't be in transmit, you know, and what I want brands to start doing, obviously, is absolutely what we've talked about today, which is I want brands to open up to understanding that sex sells in a very different way to the way that that hoary old phrase has been used. Mm -hmm. Because historically, when people go, oh, advertising, sex sells, they are only ever talking about the male lens on sex. We have not even begun to see how well sex sells when you sell through the female lens on sexuality. And, and um, something I ask people to do, Cheryl, to, to really understand this is, and I'm going to say this to our audience now, if you want to know what I mean by that, watch the movie Magic Mike XXL. Mm -hmm. So this is the okay. sequel to the Magic Mike movie. And yes, it's a movie about strippers, male strippers, but it's a movie that is absolutely filmed through the female lens. Okay. And ironically, by the way, with a male director. And, and, and what I mean by that is when you watch Magic Mike XXL, this is sex as it's joyous, it's happy, it's celebratory, it's moving, it's intimate, it's vulnerable, it's wonderful. Men listening, I guarantee you as much as everybody else will absolutely love Magic Mike XXL. That is the power of the female lens on sex and sexuality. And it's why our industry has not even begun to see how effectively we can sell through natural, open, healthy, life-affirming, wonderful, universal human sexuality. I'm inspired. I have to go watch that movie. Anyway, we are out of time. Cindy Gallup, keep blowing shit up, okay? We need you to. Uh, and thank you for all the important work that you do. It was a pleasure having this conversation. Uh, what's the web address for Make Love Not Porn if people want to check it out? Yep, um, to, so, so, so go to makelovenotporn.tv and you can follow us at Make Love Not Porn on Instagram and Twitter. Love it. Thank you so much for join, joining me today. I'm Cheryl Goldstein. This is IAB There, and thanks for watching.